Well, I'm not sure how, but I managed to get here without my computer. So I don't have, well, I do have slides, but you can't see them. <laughs> so <laughs> I could hold them up like this, but I don't think it's going to help any. Yeah, and I didn't figure that would help. Um, we're in Hebrews 13, and so we should just continue. We're looking at pressing on to maturity, and we're looking in Hebrews 13. I am kind of sad that the slides didn't make it, because they were, they were pretty good. They were pretty good. Now, I had some things I was hoping to show that I feel like are a lot easier to follow visually, so, uh, oh well, do what we can do. Hebrews 13, uh, Verses 1 through 8 is where uh, we are drawing to a close the letter. And these are the reminders, if you will, of New Testament teachings. They are, all of them, just reminders of things that went before. But we were told that we needed you know, to go on from the elementary principles to maturity. And I'm tempted to draw... A parallel between this in Hebrews 13 verses 1 through 8 and the elements or the elementary principles in Hebrews 6 verses 1 and 2. Um, I count six things in Hebrews 6 and seven things in Hebrews 13 and um, they are you know mutually exclusive things. Uh, seems like these our maturity topics. These are the kinds of things that we talk about when we are mature. Um, so I, there's that. For what it's worth, uh, I count them as things that we actually should treat as more mature things. Uh, you know, repentance, faith, baptisms, uh, you know, laying on of hands or fellowship, resurrection, and the judgment are all of them elementary. That is the simple stuff, the straightforward doctrine of the Lord. But these things uh, in Hebrews 13, 1 through 8, are, are uh, brotherly love, hospitality, uh, remembering prisoners and those who are mistreated, uh, holding marriage in honor, being free from the love of money, remembering our spiritual leaders, and making sure that we understand that Christ is always the same or that he is unchanging. Those are mature things, as, it, as he uh, points it out. So, we should look at them, I think. Uh, and probably i just go ahead and take them one by one here, since we don't have the visual aids. Um, but I'm, I'm tempted to, uh, yeah, to put those side by side and realize kind of graphically that they are mutually exclusive things and that one of them is identified as the elementary principles and the other must fall under the other category being maturity. Um, there were of course many other things that came in between that are also hard to understand if you will. They, they take study and understanding but I think that the, the major premise is that it leads us to understand the fear of God, to understand the, the uh, importance and magnitude of the kingdom that we are inheriting. And the purpose is these things, that we should live this way. First thing being, let brotherly love continue. Hebrews 13, 1. Let brotherly love continue. And uh, I compare that to Romans 12 verses 9 and 10, which read, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. So it's true we as Christians ought to treat one another very well and very kindly. And as he says, outdo one another in showing uh, honor. Yeah, we ought to be brotherly, we ought to be kind and affectionate with one another. Um, and show honor where honor is due. But let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast what is good. 
Yeah, it has to be the real thing. You've got to be sincere. And this is the idea, I think, with let brotherly love remain or let it continue. In Hebrews 13, 2, we have hospitality. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I don't know who says unawares anymore, but the English Standard Version does, apparently. Um, unwittingly, unknowingly, without knowing it. But do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Um, this idea, this hospitality, is the ancient Near East practice, and I think it's actually still alive in a lot of the Near East. Uh, the uh, practice of um, showing, uh, I guess, a, a sh this grand practice of hospitality, that travelers would be welcomed to a city, people would be ready to receive travelers and put them up in their home so that they could, you know, exchange with them. They could give them rest, give them food, tell them what's so, you know, what's so great about this town and its people and its history and and hear story, you know, world uh, news of the world from those who are traveling through as well. And then, and there's a grand tradition about being, you know, kind to your guests and to travelers. And in that time, of course, you know, um, you would have gone a great distance to reach the next city, and, and it was something that took you all day, and you were going to need to rest for the night. And people understood this, and it was not, you know, some kind of a threat or a weird thing. So foreigner comes into the city, you know, traveling, you can tell the person is alone and is not from around here. So they showed kindness sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> sometimes they showed kindness <laughs> to strangers who came to town. Um, this is the meaning of hospitality and why it says strangers. That means foreigners. Um, They did this, of course, just culturally, but the children of Israel did this too because they were commanded to show kindness to foreigners because they too were foreigners in the land of Egypt. And they're resident aliens where they were, and we are as well resident aliens here on earth. We confess that we have here no abiding city. So we are kind to strangers as well, people that are not from here, uh, not familiar with this area, uh, that you know, that need a hand. We, as the children of God, should be there to show that kindness and, you know, to be trustworthy guides. And there are many who are not trustworthy. As you know, there are lots of sharks, lots of sharks, who take advantage of people. But as a Christian, uh, fearing God, you show hospitality to strangers. And it says some have entertained angels without knowing it. It's just, it's just an example of, well, we, uh, we mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just an example of, you know, Lot didn't know they were angels until some other things started happening that made it clear. Um, he was just showing kindness. And for that matter, uh, the parents of Samson didn't realize they were talking to an angel. Now, there are many such instances in Scripture where they receive somebody who clearly isn't from around here, but they showed them kindness, and they helped them. And sometimes, of course, that turned out to be a really good thing because of who they really were. You never know who you're talking to, and everybody is important. But we have Romans 12, 13 on this, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Among all the other things in Romans 12, which sounds a lot like the closing of Hebrews, actually, in that it gives you a bunch of reminders. Uh, among that list is this, right? Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So we're looking to do this. We're, we're ready to do this. And I think in the spiritual sense, it would mean that Christians who come um, among us <clears throat> or with whom we come into contact can be refreshed through us, that they find in us uh, a little bit of home. Um, the same faith, the same God, the same uh, morals, and you know some measure of safety and of comfort while they are 
away. All right. Uh, the next thing in the list is Hebrews 13.3. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. And remember those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. And it's true, we also are in the body. We're under a threat, if you will, in that, you know, anything can happen, tides can turn. You know, all of us are subject to the same frailties. Uh, humans break easily, what can you say? But he said, remember those who are in prison and those who are mistreated. When it comes to those who are in prison, I'm reminded of Matthew 25, verse 36, where Jesus speaks about dividing you know, the goats from the sheep and, and to those who are on his right, he says, you did these good things for me insofar as you did them for the least of these little ones. One of the things that they did in Matthew 25, 36, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And it's true, when you're in prison, you're in need. You're not earning any money, so you need things and your family needs things. And um, when somebody is in prison, you know, and you, you visit them, meaning you're coming to see them, you're checking on them in some regular sense. That's the meaning as well when it says that they're, uh, he says, I was sick and you visited me, meaning you cared for me um, in some way. Same is true for prison. You know, the, the person who is in prison needs a lot of help. They're, they're not able to make money. Their family is not able, uh, you know, to have an easy time without that income. They need uh, moral support. They need Bible teaching, right? There's a lot of things that a Christian needs. Um, and, you know, who better to supply that than Christians? We should be the ones who do something about that, who visit. And, you know, the the question of why are they in prison is a different matter, right? Uh, it, it could be because they've done wrong and they need to, to repent, and perhaps they already have, but they've got to serve their time, and so, you know, we're going to help to the best of our ability. But it could also be that they're unjustly imprisoned because of the faith. That happens. Or just plain unjustly imprisoned, with no regard to the faith. That's possible. It's not terribly germane, I think, to consider why are they there. What you know is that this is your your brother, your sister, and they need your encouragement and your support and your help, and they should get it. Uh, others in the world have this right and and enjoy these, these things from their family. Why shouldn't the family of God be at least as good? But you have also 2 Timothy 1, verse 8, where Paul tells the young man, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Right, the power of God is perfected in weakness, 2 Corinthians 13, but the power of God is, is uh, evidenced in Paul while he is imprisoned, and, and he's telling the young man, look, uh, don't be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord, don't be ashamed of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel. There's something to that too, that if you're going to visit somebody who is imprisoned because of the gospel, and it, you're visiting them because of the gospel that you obeyed, well, you know, isn't there at least a chance that you'll walk in but not walk out? Uh, or whoever is there will notice that, hey, he's one of them, get him. You know, that, that could happen. So nonetheless, with bravery, you still do it. I mean, we read about uh, when, uh, when Stephen was stoned to death in Acts 7, it says devout men raised a lamentation over him and buried him. And it's true, it would have taken some stout fellas, not because he was a big heavy guy, but it would have taken some stout fellas to stand up to a reigning political party that just stoned someone to death for espousing these beliefs. So it took guts for them to do that, and they did it. Um, there's no record of anything bad happening to them. But whether it did or it didn't, they did what was right. And we also ought to remember those in prison, we also were in the body. Uh, we have, and, and to be, you know, as it says, don't be ashamed of the testimony, and don't be ashamed of the prisoner. You know, stand up for what is right. 
And that's true. You know, evil doesn't just age off or go away. We have to fight it. We have to stand up to it. Also, this came from Hebrews 10.34. Um, remember those in prison has a reference to something that they literally did which is Hebrews 10 34 you had compassion on those who are now in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your own property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one so the people to whom he wrote this already underwent this trial they had compassion on those in prison they accepted the plundering of property they knew that there was something better coming. They had a better possession, an abiding possession, something that lasts and is worth it, heaven. And as far as remember those who are mistreated, that same word occurs in Hebrews 11.37, where it records that the children of God over time were stoned, sawn in two, killed with the sword, went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. So again, when he says, remembering that you too are in the body, there's a little bit of, this can happen to you. How do you want to be treated if this becomes your lot? What would you like for Christians to do for you and your family if you're the one who gets taken? There's part of that. There's also a part of, are you strong enough to stand in the event of such a calamity? But we're re required in maturity to remember those who are in prison, remember those who are mistreated. Um, you know, maturity requires standing up for them and doing what's right, not, you know, not giving in to societal, you know, uh, surface morality, <laughs> virtue signaling. Hebrews 13, 4, honor marriage. Right? This is... Uh, Fairly straightforward, Hebrews 13, 4 reads, Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. It's a useful passage in so far as it defines, the, it, it's a very simple definition for how we conduct ourselves with regard to gratification of sexual desire. The marriage is held in honor. The marriage bed is undefiled. Every other bed is either sexual immorality or adultery. So that's plain. Sexual immorality is just the word fornication. And that means uh, anything that is immoral, anything that is not a husband and a wife who belong to each other. But adultery specifically refers to those who are married and engage in fornication. So, uh, it's just saying all kinds of coming together that are not husband and wife are forbidden. If they're not married, it's fornication. If they're married, it's adultery. But what the category is is not terribly important. They're sin, and they cause a loss of souls. That's the important thing. What should be honored is marriage. It's a valuable thing, a precious thing is what that means should be considered valuable and precious, an important thing. And when he says, let the marriage bed be undefiled, you know, if marriage is held in honor, and then the marriage bed is held undefiled. So these are parallel, and what it means is that our actions can honor marriage and keep uh, the bed clean, or pure, we should say, uh, or our actions can dishonor marriage and bring impurities to the bed. So that's the meaning of the passage. It's, it's rather, you know, as we say, it's rather plain, it's rather simple. But it's useful because it gives us a definition. Because people are always coming up with new ways to commit fornication. It's just, it seems like there's no end to the various combinations of things that people come up with. But it comes down, it comes down to one thing, which is, Marriage is what is honorable. That's what God will accept. One man, one woman for life. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6, we speak of being living free. You say, live free, man. Yeah, live free from the love of money. That's what it says. 
Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Keep your, your life free from love of money. Be content with what you have. He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can say confidently, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? All right. So we keep the life free from the love of money and we are content with what we have. And we are able to do this because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when we have God and God is with us, then we have what we need. Everything else is, is icing, is cake, you know. Keep the life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. If you can be content with what you have, you overcome so many troubles in life. It's the desire to have more that is a real problem for people. Um, this is the, the love of money on this one, but in many of the passages, uh, including some of those that we're going to look at here, 1 Timothy chapter 6, for example, if you want to turn there, 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10, there's a word there that is uh, different from loving silver. It is moreness. <laughs> it's this desire for more. And, you know, that's a bad amount. I remember when they asked Kinky Friedman how much it costs to go to school in Texas, and he said, too much. <laughs> uh, which I like, because, you know, it's a silly question, and his answer is correct. <laughs> I actually like that. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> uh, but um, in this case, the amount is more. How much do you want more? How much do you need more? Right? <laughs> when it's always more and it's never enough, that's a problem. Um, the eye is not satisfied with seeing. The ear is not satisfied with hearing, meaning it doesn't get full. There's not, you know, a threshold here where stuff stops coming in. Uh, well, there probably is. At some point in the sermon, right, that happens to everybody. But um, the, the, the idea is that if we live with this idea of more, then we're never happy. You never have enough. You're never satisfied. It always, it's got to be something else, something else, something else. And you'll be driven, um, which some say is ambition, which you lack. But no, it's not that. It's that you know what's important and you know what's not important. Now, 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10, godliness with contentment is great gain. See, uh, he's contrasting this with false teachers who think that godliness is a means of gain. And that's true. People will try to extort money from the churches. I understand that. But godliness with contentment is indeed great gain. The quickest way to become fabulously rich in this world is to become a Christian and be content with what you have. And you will find out, if you count your blessings, that you have much more than you need. You are fabulously wealthy as an American. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. It's true. But if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. Uh, our saying is food, clothing, and shelter, but in Greek uh, the clothing idea includes things that cover your head, like roofs. Uh, you know, having food and clothing, with these we are content. Some, some place, some shelter, some protection from the elements, enough to eat. And we're content, we have what we need. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And it's true, you can find all kinds of useless things to spend wealth on, <laughs> or all kinds of useless goals to chase, unimportant things. Sorry. That means I'm running out of time on the tape. Um, there are all kinds of useless things that you can chase. And as it says, there are harmful desires even that plunge people into ruin and destruction. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Many different things come 
from people's desire for money. They love the money, and so they sell out at all levels of society, at all levels of rank, and, you know, that's how it is. Money drives the world, unfortunately. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Yeah, the pursuit of riches can lead you into a whole lot of things that are just not necessary. And you can live right and be right with God and be content with what you have and be, as we said, very wealthy in the Lord. Then we have, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that he said. In Genesis 28 is the first one of these. This idea, I will never leave you or forsake you, has occurred in multiple places. But it seems to me clear that, uh, well, it occurs in some measure in multiple places. You know, I will never leave you, or I will not forsake you, or I'll always be with you, you know, something like that. But this statement, I will never leave you nor forsake you, occurs in specific places, and these are they. Genesis 28, 15 is one. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So God has already promised to the fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And they're going to leave, of course, and go to Egypt. Right? And come back to this land. God did, did not break that promise. He kept that promise. Then in Deuteronomy 31, you have, um, you have Moses telling the people, at verse 8, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So the fathers had this promise, and Moses has this promise, which he gives to the children of Israel who do go back and inherit that land. And then Joshua gets this in Joshua 1, verse 5. God says, No man will be able to stand before you, Joshua, all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. So Joshua is given the encouragement to stay strong and to lead the people. He, in some sense, is assuming the role of Moses who led them, but did not enter the promised land. Joshua led them into the promised land. And his name, of course, is Jesus, if you transliterate it to Greek. He's the one that got them in. Moses doesn't get them in. Jesus gets them in. But he has the promise from God, I will not leave you, I will not forsake you. So we had it with the fathers, we have it with Moses and the people, and now specifically with the second Moses, Joshua, if you will. And in 1 Chronicles 28, we see it with David and Solomon, the kingdom that God has established uh, when he makes Judah the throne. In 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20, David says to Solomon his son, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. The Lord God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. David, as he leaves, hands off the work of building the temple to Solomon and gives him what he has been given. God is not going to leave or forsake. He will be with you until the end to get this done. Uh, and Jesus said, a little bit, you know, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But this phrase, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that occurs in Hebrews, clearly is a reference to this phrase as it occurs in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament. The principle applies, as we said. Jesus said that very similar thing that is clearly the same idea. But for the purposes of studying Hebrews and what it's saying is, here's how you teach from the Old Testament. This is what we get from it. These are the lessons of those things that are recorded. And uh, the psalm itself is Psalm number 118. And there's a lot of things in that psalm. It's, it's rather lengthy, but it's about the deliverance of God. And the quotation is verses 5 through 7. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. 
The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I will look in triumph on those who hate me. So when we are in distress, we call to the Lord. The Lord is our helper at our side. Which is a really interesting thing to say in the New Testament, uh, especially uh, in John's Gospel, the Holy Spirit is called the Helper, or if you have a really terrible translation, the Paraclete, <laughs> which is the Greek word, Paraclete. But what's great about that word is para being uh, alongside and clete being uh, called. So the person who is called to your side. This is usually... Um, in legal contexts, and it means your attorney, your advocate, um, but it also means your helper, somebody who's at your side. And you know, this perhaps would go all the way back to Eve being taken from the side of Adam and called a helper, that she's at his side, she's there with him. Um, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I will look in triumph on those who hate me. What can man do? I, I will not fear. What can man do to me? This is in the context of remember the prisoners and remember uh, those who are mistreated. Yep, that's what he's saying. God has not left or forsaken you. Even if you do suffer. Then we have Hebrews 13, 7, remember your leaders. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Here, it seems clear to me that we're speaking about the apostles, although it would potentially be true of uh, the leaders in the congregation. But it seems to me that this is about the apostles. The leaders who spoke to you the word of God consider the outcome of their way of life, imitate their faith. 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verses 12 to 13. We ask you, brothers, respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And we ask you to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Um, that one would argue that it's about your leaders in the local congregation who are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And it says to esteem them highly in love because of their work. Because they care for us. They, they're there to, to help us. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. When it comes to way of life, uh, this is really defined best by Peter in 1 Peter. He uses this word several times. First one is 1 Peter 1, verse 15, and also verse 18. In 15 he said, As he who called you is holy, you also become holy in all your conduct. And in verse 18 he said, You are ransomed from futile ways inherited from your forefathers. The futile ways, that's the way of life. So on the one hand, because God calling us is holy, we become holy in all our ways. On the other hand, the ways of our forefathers were futile and we were redeemed from those things to become Christians. Then in chapter 2, verse 12, First Peter says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. So we live in this world blameless. We live in this world with conduct that is honorable. How to live in the world, as Hebrews 13, 7 says, consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. The way of life. Keep your way of life among the Gentiles honorable, is what 1 Peter 2, 12 says. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, Wives, be subject to your husbands, so that even if some don't obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So your behavior, your way of life, makes it very hard for a husband to deny the power of God. He can see the choices that you are making and how you are living with him because of your faith in God. He can see that something else is controlling this. Something else is, is, 
is at, at sway, has sway with her. And she is always gracious, and that's a wonderful thing. In 1 Peter 3, verse 16, he said, Keep a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good way of life in Christ may be put to shame. And in 2 Peter 3, when he closes with his ideas of the, uh, or his vision of the end of the world, the 11th verse reads, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? That's the manner of life. Consider the outcome. Consider the eternal weight. And imitate those, uh, imitate their faith is what uh, he said. And Philippians 3.17 tells us, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Very New Testament idea that we imitate the faith of the apostles and we also look to good examples in the brotherhood. Finally, Hebrews 13, 8, Christ is the same. Which reads simply, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, if I were translating this, I would do it differently. I would say Jesus Christ yesterday and today is the same, even into the ages. Um, which is always how it says forever, into the ages. Um, and when they say forever and ever, it says into the ages of ages, um, which is a lot. <laughs> if you start multiplying, you know, it's one thing to have a century. It's another thing to have a century of centuries. That's a hundred squared. That's a lot of years, right? So one thing into the ages, but into ages of ages. And you say, well, it'd be easier to say forever and ever. Yeah, I know. But the point is, it can be understood. The reason he says it the way he does, and the reason I think it would be important to translate it that way is, they're realizing that the anointed Joshua is a throne they didn't ex expect. It is a priesthood they didn't expect. And it is a kingdom they didn't expect. But they need to recognize that this anointed Joshua yesterday and today is the same. And he will be the same into the ages. Always unchangeable. But they need to understand that. That it's the same God in the Old and the New Testament. They're not uh, leaving the religion of God. They're fulfilling the religion of God. Remember, this letter is to Hebrews. These are Jews who obeyed the gospel. And there's a lot more to talk about in that vein. But as regards the, maybe these kind of elementary, or these uh, rather pressing on to maturity points, they just have to realize it's the same God that they're serving. The God of yesterday is the God of today and is the God that will be forevermore. Nothing has changed in, some, in that sense. God is still God. And this was always his will. And this was always his intention. Right. So, there's that. When it comes to the, uh, the translation itself, um, I actually... I was looking at this kind of closely in the original and I, I feel like these verses really, verses 1 through 8, these verses are really kind of a song, actually. And if you look at them closely, you can start to see that they are structured like Hebrew poetry. Right? Uh, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For thereby, some have entertained angels unawares. But it's just like a proverb. They're, the way that they do things, where they, they come in a couplet, you know, A and B. The first thing is said, the second thing is a variation of what was said that adds to it or explains it or magnifies it in some way. And all of, you know, 
That's how you always do Hebrew poetry throughout all of Scripture. If you haven't noticed, start noticing. It starts real early. Uh, the song of Lamech to his wives, poor, poor things, <laughs> follows this pattern. Um, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. Those, that's a couplet. One thing to remember the people who are in prison, another thing to imagine you were there. Stronger, right? Remember those mistreated, since you are also in the body. That's a covenant. Remembering people who are mistreated is one thing. Recognizing that that could be you is another thing. Let marriage be held in honor, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. There's an explanation, a fine point. Sexually immoral and adulterous, God will judge. This is how the text reads. That seems fairly clear. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. It's a couplet. It's Hebrew poetry, isn't it? This is a song. He has said, I'll never leave or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's a psalm. That's literally a psalm. It's a couplet and it fits in right next to the other ones. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. And then, Jesus Christ, yesterday and today, is the same, even into the ages. And that's the seventh, that's the seventh one. So I'm tempted to, to draw this as poetry. I, I think it should be done as, as though it were a song. It would probably be a pretty good song. <laughs> For what it's worth, and I don't know what it's worth, other than to say, the appeal of, uh, of Paul, it's obviously Paul, isn't it? Can we all agree? This is obviously Paul. <laughs> um, look how many times he quotes the letters of Paul. <laughs> uh, the appeal of Paul to his brethren in their native way of thinking and reading and learning about God. Right? That's, that's why I think that it's important to see this as Hebrew poetry. To understand how genuine, how earnest, and how strong this appeal is. It's reaffirming. You're not a turncoat Jew. You are a real Jew. You are the real child of God. The whole purpose for our nation was this, and you are living it. That's encouragement. At a time when they're being treated like turncoats, and it gets more pointed than this, which we'll have to cover in the next in the next lesson. It gets more pointed in the next few verses. But that should be enough. So think about comparing them to the elementary principles. Think about putting them in, in uh, you know poetic form. And consider how they are all of them reminders of the doctrine of the Lord. But it's interesting to think these are the things that are maturity. These are actually the things that are harder to do. Why is that? I think those things are worth thinking about. Why are these the hard things? And it's that same thing. It's that tug of the world and, and persecution. The need for faith to endure. You have need of endurance. I thank you for your kind thought and attention. Today, are you a child of God? We have water here that you might obey the gospel. We're glad to help you to obey now or whenever we can. Give, it, give a call. Whatever we can do to help, we are glad to do it. For in baptism, we are buried, putting to death the old person, and resurrected 
a new creation in Christ where all things have become new and we're pleasing to him and we have a new start are you a Christian who hasn't lived right well repent make things right with God put it off no longer let us help you with our prayers if we can if today you need our prayers or you need to obey the gospel let the need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing <laughs>